The Telberg Foundation is deeply committed to the idea that the 21st century needs leaders who are courageous, innovative, global in perspective, and infused with universal values. That's why we established the Telberg SNF Eliasson Global Leadership Prize. In 2021, our global jury selected two amazing leaders for this award. Asha DeVos is a pioneering Sri Lankan marine biologist who has established a world-class marine conservation research and educational institution in her country. And Tara Mustonen, a Finnish climate scientist, fisherman, and community leader, blends the wisdom of local and indigenous peoples with scientists to define new approaches to climate change. In this edition of New Thinking for a New World, two 2021 jurors will discuss with our winners their views on the challenges of global leadership today. Now listen as David Kiernan, a prominent American litigator, talks with Asha DeVos about oceans, colonial science, and working towards a healthier planet. Let me start by asking you, uh, what does it mean to you to be a leader? I would say from, from a personal angle, I think everyone can be a leader, right? I think we, we emphasize like, you know, you, you're born a leader. And I think in some ways that's not entirely true. I think we can cultivate leadership. Um, but I think it's there's a lot of key things that you have to think about when you're going into this space. Um, and it can come naturally as well. So a few things like, for example, I think, you learn that your life is not just your own and it can be used for something. It can be more useful than to, you know, everyone else as well and not just to yourself. And I think that's a key point. Um, you, you have to make, well, I mean, you know, that you, you live by a certain set of values, right? And so you make decisions based on those values. And sometimes those decisions might not help you in the short term, but they will help others in the long term. Uh, they may open up doors for other people that might not get opportunities. And that is based on that one decision that you will make. I think it's about being honest about your journey and letting people see you for who you are. So that relatability, I think, makes a massive difference because it allows people to believe in themselves as well. And I think we are all human and I think we mustn't disconnect from everybody and just assume that, oh, I'm a leader. Therefore, you know, I'm so special because we're not. We're all made of the same flesh and blood and the same kind of drive and passion for life. And we have to make sure we kind of stir those fires in other people and let them believe in themselves as well. And I also think, you know, um, it's about, uh, you know, basically, um, I mean, it's a long journey and learning to work really hard and building, you know, over time you build this trust. I think the reason these journeys are long is because along the way you're building trust and trust doesn't happen overnight. And that trust is based on the kinds of decisions you're making, the way you interact with people, how you allow people into your life, how you listen. Listening is such a big task for a leader, a leader, a really key trait, I would say. And finally, I think it's about living your best life so others can live theirs. Well, thank you. In, in looking through some of your, uh, your interviews, you talk about uh, vision. How does having a vision help you serve as a leader? I think having a vision gives you something to anchor onto, right? It's like we talk about this, um, your, your true north, right? So you have something that you could have in the distance and you know that's where you're trying to get. And I think it's really helpful to have that. One key thing is I've noticed even in my own journey that my vision has kind of evolved over time, right? I started off many years ago wanting to be a marine biologist, wanting to be, uh, you know, I was trying to fulfill a dream of becoming a marine biologist in a country where being a marine biologist was unheard of. It was a very personal dream. But over time, I realized that, you know what, like now I'm here, I can create space for other people. And that's how I kind of evolved my vision into what it is today, which is about, you know, kind of creating space for others to enter the field so we can create a much bigger team to tackle the grand challenges of our oceans. So I think having that vision also helps to make decisions and in some of the toughest moments because you know that that's my vision and making this de decision doesn't serve that vision and therefore I need to walk away. And I think that's been a really key part of having a vision. And, and is part of that vision Ocean Swell, the nonprofit that you're a part of? Is that where the vision would, would lead to? Uh, yeah, certainly. So Ocean Swell is, I would say, a part of that vision. So for me, like I mentioned, you know, when I started out, you know, at 17, I was like fresh faced and excited about becoming a marine biologist. Right. So I was telling everybody, oh, I'm going to be a marine biologist. And Sri Lankans were like, oh, that's awesome. Like, what are you going to do with that degree? And I come from this 
beautiful tropical island, right? So I was clearly the one with the you know long-term job prospects and so not really anyone else. But the point being that, you know, everybody was telling me that I couldn't do it. And then as I've grown in the field, I realized that representation, you know, develop, you know, the 70% of our coastlines are in the developing world or the global south. But the vast majority of people who work in this space aren't. The representation at the global stage is negligible, right? And so for me, my kind of drive now is try to build, you know, increase diversity in marine sciences and marine conservation, uh, make it a much more inclusive field and make it more equitable. And, you know, if we truly want to save our oceans, every coastline needs a local hero. And that is... You know, local heroes can come from anywhere. You don't have to have a degree in marine science to care for the oceans, to care for anything, in fact. And so my vision, Ocean Swell, allows me, you know, I, I built this organization so I can start to kind of nurture that next generation of diverse ocean heroes here in Sri Lanka. And I've seen, you know, the fruits of my labor, more people than ever before want to be marine scientists, right, which is awesome. And that means, you know, we can show to the world that, you know, it is possible for you as well. And so this is a grand, a small part of a grand journey. Um, and I think it's working. One of, the, one of the concepts that you introduced me to was a, a colonial behavior in science. And I guess, first of all, to, to have uh, outstanding women in science was a was a big deal when I was growing up. Now that I'm older, and you, on top of that, have introduced the the notion of the, that there is a colonial behavior to some of the, the marine science in the world, even though it's a global scientific network. Um, how do you how do you deal with those issues? Yeah, so just to, so that everybody's on the same page, basically, colonial science or parachute science um, or conservation is really where you have you know, scientists or researchers from the global north coming into countries in the global south, like Sri Lanka, doing work, but really not investing in the local uh, local capacity or infrastructure and just bouncing, right? Leaving to go process their data, do whatever they have to do. And kind of, that kind of uh, creates a dependency on the external teams. It cripples local conservation efforts. Um, it that work is often driven by outsiders' assumptions and motives and can have, you have this unhealthy power imbalance, right? And and so that's a really unhealthy situation because, you know, we, like I said, you know, the ocean is vast, it's huge, there's room for everyone and we need to be encouraging more people into space. And a handful of people from one small part of the globe can't tackle all the grand challenges that we face. So for me, it really is about how do we create that equity, right? Like that, how do we make a more equitable planet? How do we, uh, build guidelines and, and build collaborations and partnerships that are equal. So we are, we, I mean, through Oceanswell, I have projects where we have incredible scientists from, you know, Canada, Australia, the US, but we come together as a single team. We realize that we need both, all people in that team to successfully get the work done. We recognize that capacity is not built just one way where the outsider comes in and tells us, you know, how to do things. They might have the technical capacity, but we have the local expertise. And without both those ingredients, we can't actually succeed, right, in resolving the problem. But it's also about then leaving things behind, right? So making sure that whoever's involved in the project can run the project, understands the project, and can do the science in the absence of the rest of us so that the work can continue in the long term. And there's lo this is such a, it's a conversation that's bubbling. I actually was just talking um, at a workshop you know, just before I came in here and I worked, talked about this at a workshop yesterday. So it's bubbling in all spaces and I'm really excited. I think we might be at a tipping point where we're truly really understanding how we can do better, not just for ourselves, but also for the planet. So true for the global issues we're dealing with. Let me ask you um, one last question. What changes would you like to see in the space? Yeah, for me, you know what? I would just like to see where uh, you know uh, marine science where you know we have anyone and everyone feels like they are best prepared to make great decisions for our oceans right so really um you can be a banker you can be a baker you can be an accountant you can be um you know a garment factory worker it doesn't matter 
every one of us has an, does something that has an impact on the oceans. And I want everyone to be able to access all the stories and the information to be inspired and excited about the oceans and to be, you know, have a strong desire to protect it, knowing that they can be part of the solution and not just part of the problem. And I think that's a really big thing. And I think that's where we're going to make a difference if we truly are more open and inclusive and accepting of the fact that every coastline needs a local hero. And how, how do you describe local heroes? What, what, give me a sense of what a local hero would be. To me, a local hero is someone who, you know, kind of lives in a certain space, uh, can speak the local language, can have a cup of tea with the local community, can see problems as they arise, can address them with local solutions, not a blanket global solution, but really understand like here in this area, this is what will work, can, you know, motivate the people around them to come together to address what's going on on the ground. I think those people can come from anywhere. And they can be anyone. And I think that's what we have to remember. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and again, congratulations. Thank you so much. Our next conversation features Martha Renette of the Think School of Creative Leadership in the Netherlands and Tara Mastonen talking about life north of the Arctic Circle. Um, first of all, congratulations on winning this uh, prestigious prize. This is uh, really, really great. Um, I'd love to start this conversation by asking you about something that is very much at the core of who you are and what you do, um, Atero, is, you know, you, I think you describe yourself first and, and foremost as a fisherman, besides the fact that you are, you know, also a professor, you're a researcher, you know, you um, also are the president and, and, and co-founder of, of uh, Snow Change, uh, and also the head of your village of Selki. Um, so I would love to hear a bit more about, you know, what role does fishing play, uh, especially in terms of understanding the ecosystem? Yes, uh, first of all, I would just like to also join Asha and everybody else in thanking the foundation and, and the audience and, and all involved parties just to get it out of the way. Uh, <clears throat> and and uh, we think this award, despite having that long list of titles that I carry, uh, is really for the whole staff of Snow Change and our uh, community. So that's, that's never a one man's job, especially a man. Um, <clears throat> fishing. Well, the thing in, uh, what's really important to understand regarding Finland is that this is the place where the world's oldest net finding has been discovered. And uh, that was over 10,000 years ago. So we may not do everything really well, but we do fish well. And I was in a fortunate position from very early on to be raised up in the fishery, even part-time commercial harvests with my father, and then in um, maybe 25 years ago, I started to go to another school, as I often say, which is the, uh, on the ice with the really old fishermen, commercial fishermen like uh, Kalevi Vierikka and Olli Klemola and many others. And the reason why I say that is that in these northern parts of the planet, uh, the Arctic and the Boreal, uh, fishing is very much different than what people expect that to be. It's a communion and communication for the lack of better term, with cosmos. And even in our language, we have survived, despite the fact of being a modern society, we say pyytä, which means that we never say we go and take fish. We go and ask the lake or the river to give us that fish. And it's a very different, propo um, shall we say, view on nature than one of uh, conquering and destroying. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and now I'd love to... Um to delve a little bit deeper into, um, into Finland, into your home country, Finland. So uh, I've been there a couple of times and, uh, and I was always very impressed with, you know, the, you know, the forest and the nature. And it always felt to me, this is the impression that I had that, uh, you know, the Finns were very protective of the environment and they had a very good relationship with it, no? And, um, and then I, uh, you know, so I always thought that, you know, the, the people from the Nordics, you know, were very quite progressive in, in terms of, you know, the relationship with their, with their environment. Um, but then you you said that you are actually working towards challenging the Finnish norms um, and in terms of the relationship with the environment and the environmental preservation. Um, so I would love to hear a bit more about what you mean about that and how you do. How do you actually change mindsets and behaviors? 
and maybe tell us also a little bit more about um, how do you evaluate progress so far? I think you are very correct in the sense that the Nordics, Sweden, Norway and Finland are considered often to be extremely good PR campaign. We did things well, we have so- social justice and there are no <laughs> troubles at all. Um, well, of course, that would be a utopia that doesn't exist. The complexity of the Finnish case, without talking about the other Nordics, is the fact that uh, in the past 75 years, due to our rather specific socio-historical context, um, um, we lost 95% of our natural forests to man-made changes below the Arctic Circle. They are the reason why New York Times is being printed over decades on Finnish paper. The pulp mills are churning up the, the, uh, <clears throat> our forests into pulp. One of the complexities with that model is that we are, while we have made as a society a big choice in economic terms that has provided for the social systems, free education, and some of the other benefits in our society, it has come now in a price that's very high. Mm-hmm. Not many people know that in, in world's boreal and arctic peatlands and forest ecosystems, there's one third of world's remaining soil carbon. And people think of, of Amazonia and the rainforests as the lungs of the world, but it's actually here where you can find a lot of the untapped, uh, what people discussed also in Glasgow, the, the untapped and, and that reserve of, of a carbon budget that we still have on the planet before catastrophic harm. And now if, if we put these two drivers together, uh, the image of Nordic forestry and the use of forests, unfortunately, is very different on the ground. Clear cuts, ditching, churning, most of these millions and millions of hectares of peatlands, hydro dams destroyed the last Atlantic salmon rivers, has also had huge social consequences that we are not even discussing. And people's feelings... Of course, others have taken economic gain from these points, but uh, there are also great, shall we say, intergenerational trauma in many villages. Now, how do we change that is a question that uh, is a very lonely place. I'm not, of course, the only one. There are many progressive thinkers and critical voices on what happened to our forests. I was starting my talk by saying that we are lake people and forest people And then, of course, we are kind of in a situation of a self-colonization or or a very deep crisis where we know what the natural forest could be, yet we choose to have 95 or over 90 percent for uh, whole landscapes of economic timber lots. Uh, It's really the answer to your final question is that hectare by hectare. So rewilding and restoration and community-led work is a mechanism to try to do better on watersheds. And the last thing maybe to add is that every hectare we are able to work on it becomes a globally significant site because of the Atlantic flyway and the birds and the carbon and biodiversity hotspots that are here. Great. Thanks. Yeah, this is a, indeed a quite a shocking numbers. Um, and what about... Um, you do all your work, you know, from a very specific place, a uh, quite far north. Uh, and uh, so I'd love to hear a bit more about, you know, how do you, uh, you know, how do you lead um, from a very isolated place, right? South is quite far from the rest of, you know, let's say of the, of the system issue, the global system, no? Uh, so I'd love to hear more about that. So how do you lead from there? You know, what kind of uh, value do you think that also uh, brings and, uh, and maybe what kind of impact also you feel that you're having from your isolated, your Selkie village? Well, of course, Sel- Selkie is connected with roads, so we are not in some kind of a very distant side. Mm-hmm. But uh, in any case, on a global map, we are on the edge of, uh, it's only 40 kilometers to the Russian border mm-hmm. and uh, so on and so on. How do we lead from here? Probably comes with a view and I would say that on the margins, if you want to call us on a cultural and, and a geographical margin in the Borel and further up in the Arctic, um, we may see things that are blinded uh, on the em- empire view or on the big society view. And that's why often you will find around the world that in the marginal places, in the edges, that's where a lot of the natural resources harvesting has taken place. 
and also the people, indigenous and traditional communities, are able to recount a history that would be very sobering. And as we heard on the um, uh, very first statement today, honesty is a lonely business. Mandalorian would say bounty hunting is a lonely business, <laughs> but honesty and and the fact that uh, these kind of things are also um, something that we need clarity and the voices that we could contribute from here are hopefully something that offers a sobering message on what's really going on in the north and in, in these communities. Yeah, that's, that brings me to my last question for you, actually, before we we complete this uh, conversation is a lot of, you know, you, you, you highly value the combination of science and traditional knowledge, you know, for, you know, for rewilding uh, regeneration and, 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 and fighting climate change. Why do you think, you know, that traditional knowledge has been overlooked, ignored? I don't know what word to use really, um, to, you know, in the equation for uh, fighting climate change or for, um, you know, uh, environmental protection. Why do you think this, this has happened? Well, 80% of world's remaining biodiversity is on indigenous and traditional community lands. And indigenous knowledge was uh, a target of concentrated attack for 200 years by different governments, by churches and others. Now, in the late, this late in the game, it's a hard question. How do we learn from that wisdom and position our choices and leadership in a way that would actually matter and uh, shift the kind of things we need to do? And ultimately, it is the women, the elders and the women, where I place my trust. Because the men have really, if you want to use categorical view, it's the power of men that that has really destroyed our uh, ecosystems. And that's why it has to embrace both new ways of thinking and speed. And the only way to do that is to have a new kind of dialogues with courage and without... uh, without pride, more humbleness and more listening. Great. Thank you so much, Kitos. Um, (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcasts and subscribe. Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergfoundation.org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org Thank you and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation. <laughs>